you've got your coffee, I've got my Diet Mountain Dew, um, you're not going to need it because this is so exciting. We get to talk about <laughs> retirement plan, fiduciary responsibility and liability. So um, incredibly fun stuff. And actually, this is not my passion. This is my maybe my third passion. There's family, wine, maybe a few others in there. But I, I really, uh, to give you some background um, about me and about kind of how I come to actually truly enjoy this stuff, um, I started down the path probably 20 years ago of saying, I'm going out to my customers, and I was a salesperson at the time. So I was an investment advisor. I was relatively new at my trade. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm going to older people, wiser people, and trying to understand what am I supposed to be saying to all these employers and other people I'm talking to. And, and you slowly start to accumulate knowledge. But I figured there's got to be a book. You know, There's got to be some kind of book I can go to with all the rules and the stuff I'm supposed to know. And there, and there wasn't. And so I began collecting all of this information. I read the law and the Department of Labor regulations. I read you know, sub-regulatory guidance and articles and all kinds of other stuff. And it turns out to be an incredibly large and complex body of rules. And it's utterly ridiculous to think that a typical employer is not, forget about mastering it, is even going to come up with some of the simpler parts of this. So, so I, I ran across clients with stories like, um, I, had, I had one client, it's a, a mining company, coal mining company. I'm for, I live in Kentucky. So um, we have uh, coal mines in Kentucky. And so one of my clients was a coal mine, several hundred employees. And uh, they had a situation where they had a new HR person who hadn't dealt with benefits very much before. And so her problem was the 90 days. That's what she understood, 90 days. The eligibility is 90 days. So after 90 days, everybody gets in the plan, right? Well, no, there's this thing called an entry date. Um, and then there were other problems, like you're not supposed to, that the, the last contribution of someone who's been terminated from a 401k plan, do you give them a match contribution? I mean, they just quit. So for their last paycheck, are we seriously going to have to give them a match contribution? Well, yeah, if the plan document says you are, but she wasn't doing that. So, and there were other problems. There was just all kinds of stuff going wrong. So here's someone who was doing her very best to do a good job of what she thought the job was, but it turns out there was so much that she did not know that she didn't realize what she was doing wrong. It's a very complicated thing. And those stories are all over the place. It happens a lot. So this is very, um, uh, it is a very complicated trade. And uh, there is liability. So it used to be that the sales pitch for the industry, so when you're approached by record keepers, by investment salespeople, by investment advisors, you know, everybody's trying to gather clients. So what, what's the pitch? So part of what I'm going to focus on is the fact that the marketplace has evolved and it's transitioned from a marketplace where employers like you just had a lot of sales pitches coming at you to a place where now it's more of a marketplace of professional fiduciaries. So sort of like MMA as a professional fiduciary, they're, they're on the investment side. Um, my firm does similar work, other firms do similar work. We've really transitioned the nature of the industry. There, so there's this change that is starting to take place where people are thinking more about not how do I learn about eligibility, entry, and last pay period matching issues, but how do I get that off my plate? And so part of the theme today is just about outsourcing. So it's what, what does it mean that you're a fiduciary and what can you do about it realistically? So that's what I want to talk about. And I will start with liability. <coughs> um, this is just a sampling of the shorthand version of some lawsuits that are out there. Now, when the lawyers go over this stuff, they have the big, long, formal stuff. This, if you look these up on the internet, this will give you an idea. Um, Investment-based lawsuits can be big money. So what's, what has been happening over the last, I'm going to say 10 years or so, is there's been a rash of lawsuits based on excessive fees. And the excessive fees are, for the most part, because of the fact that historically the industry has charged basis points. We've charged a percentage of assets and that the, the record keeping cost is built into that. And so the argument would be that you're causing the participants to have to pay too much. Participants are overpaying because their assets have grown, but the work required to record keep the accounts hasn't grown, or at least not more than inflation, and so you don't have a justification for the reasonableness of the fees. And so there are some big lawsuits here. This uh, one of the Tibble v. Edison, that one actually just settled 
and uh, it was certainly less than the claims were for, but you know, it's a minimum of 10 million, the final amount will be. I think the Kraft case was 30 million, uh, not quite done yet. The Novant case, that's a, a, a hospital that was a, a regional hospital, so relatively small, had a financial advisor who was charging what was then common and reasonable, which is a commissioned product, so a product where he sold this product to the hospital and was paid a commission by the company in exchange for that and gave the hospital what I think he believed to be good advice and made a lot of money. So over a period of years, now all of a sudden the plan's $300 million. The commissions are kind of the same, uh, at the same level. So uh, there, there's a lawsuit saying that this financial advisor made too much money. And so, and I could go on, L look at the, the universities. So the recent one is suing all these universities. So what has happened, I have uh, an old friend who just retired, uh, who's the ERISA counsel for one of my former firms, uh, used to call the plaintiff's bar an infestation of worms. Uh, it's, it's a, it, for, for many of us looking at a list like this, it's not merely unsettling, it's really kind of annoying. Um, it's, it's kind of not right at some level, I think a lot of people feel like. Um, but on the other side of that, I have a friend who is a plaintiff's lawyer, and he said the notion that corporate America is gonna police itself is nonsense. Um, that's a fair comment too. So regardless of whether you think the plaintiff's bar is right to press some of these suits, they're doing it. They're absolutely doing it. So if you don't have a <clears throat> $100 million retirement plan, um, you're at less risk of getting an investment lawsuit. There are a handful of cases that are coming down market to a 20, 10, even $5 million plan, but nothing that has succeeded. And you know, it, it, that isn't where the money is, the old Willie Sutton thing. Why did he rob banks? That's where the money is. Well, so the plaintiff's lawyers are going to the big plans. So the point of this is that investment liability is rare. It's mainly isolated to larger plans, but it's <laughs> rapidly growing. We now have firms entering the fray on the plaintiff's bar side who are, frankly, ambulance chasers. They're the ones with the signs on the freeway that say, call me if you got in an accident. Those same firms are now entering the ERISA uh, fiduciary liability business. So um, all of a sudden what I have seen is where I used to personally view a sales tactic whereby service providers would approach folks like you all with a scare pitch about fiduciary liability. I don't like that. I don't really like it. You know what? You, you probably should be paying more attention to it now. So there's a lot more emphasis I think shifted away from like yeah 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 I'm a fiduciary I'm liable to oh wait a minute there are a lot of lawsuits out there. I better pay attention to this. Um, but <clears throat> on, the, on the investment side, big dollars potentially, unlikely that something's gonna happen, especially if you have a good process, a good advisor, and you're paying attention to the things that are getting these folks in trouble. Administrative liability is completely different. Administrative liability is death of a thousand cuts. So the examples I gave earlier about the HR manager who had trouble you know, with kind of the basics of the plan, that ended up with her spending time, with her having to learn the rules in retrospect, with the firm having to engage outside counsel and pay money for that, with them having to do corrections that even though it's money they would have paid anyway in some cases, the budgetary impact of having to go back years was incredibly painful. There were IRS user fees. So this was an extraordinarily painful event for that 300 employee company, but it, it didn't put them out of business. It wasn't a $20 million claim but it was a $200,000 claim. And there are a ton of 10 and $15,000 claims. There are a ton of little corrections. So administrative responsibility and liability in a retirement plan is really all about the death of a thousand cuts. So again, the point is, what do we do about this? Where can we actually go? So does anybody in here actually take Latin? Do we have any Latin scholars? I see a couple hands. So while I'm explaining the story here. I'm hoping somebody will translate the moral of the story for me in a moment. But I took Latin, but uh, <clears throat> I've always been interested by this. And lorem ipsum is the name that the printing industry gives to this nonsense text that is a placeholder in advertising copy. So if you're doing a sample brochure, when they're showing you what it'll look like, they'll put lorem ipsum in, in, in the placeholder for the text. and. Uh, it, it's been described as nonsense. It's actually real Latin from 45 BC or BCE, written by Cicero, but it's all jumbled up. So in the 16th century, some printer took the words and just jumbled them all up on the printing press to use as a placeholder 
so that people wouldn't get distracted by the actual message that was there. It's a text about ethics by Cicero. So who's, who's, who's my Latin scholar? Somebody going to translate? <laughs> You're smiling, so you, no? Not going to translate? Who's translating for me? No takers? All right, so Semper, as in uh, uh, Semper Fidelis, the motto of the United States Marine Corps, of which I'm a proud member. Semper means always. Ubi is a word for where, as in where are we? Sub is under. So always, where, under, where. Um, <laughs> my Latin teacher thought he was hilarious. Um, so uh, what's the point of all this? So this is, this is me going back to my beginning in the industry. Um, I'm, I'm a young guy. I'm trying to learn how to do right by people and explain risks that they have. And then I, I want to have an answer to that. And so I was taught, for example, that, OK, go out and talk about ERISA 404C. And I was taught this sales pitch about how to, how to talk to clients about ERISA 404C. And it sounds so official, right? I'm going to protect you by giving your employees education. It's a bunch of hooey. It's a nonsense sales pitch. It actually means nothing, full of sound and fury. Um, it, it, and it, this reminds me of that. Where the industry has been guilty, I think, historically, of throwing a bunch of words that really look like Latin, because that actually is Latin. Those are Latin words. But it's all jumbled around, and the people speaking them don't have any idea what it means. And then they're spouting some moral tale that, at the end of the day, that's probably useful guidance, but it just doesn't really mean anything. Um, so you can cut through that, I think, is, is the point. You can cut through the chatter of this stuff. And you, you have to do it by going to the legal. So. Uh, we want to make things simple, but we can't make them any simpler, as Einstein said. So as simple as possible, no simpler. You, you can't uh, wade through the noise unless you go straight to the bottom line of the legal arrangement, the nature of the legal arrangement. So we're going to talk about what can you do about the fact that you're a fiduciary. What does it mean, and what can you do about it? Um, and you got to go to the legal issues. So these are the burdens that you get from being a fiduciary. And uh, the knowledge burden is one that I think people don't get. I had a client, uh, this was a few years ago now, but she was a new CFO. So CFO of a company, the previous CFO was retiring, and the previous CFO felt very comfortable with things like being the plan administrator. And uh, with how to run the retirement plan, with what the ins and outs were and the, the pitfalls and things like that, what to do with a hardship distribution. These were all things that the previous CFO was comfortable with, the new one not so much. And her comment to me was, um, I don't even want to know what I'm supposed to know. I thought that was a great line. Uh, the knowledge burden is substantial. So I, I use as an example, let's take hardship distributions. So in a hardship distribution, you have to know that, OK, here's this thing where you're allowed to take money out of the plan. There are rules about what you're allowed to take out and when. You have to have a basic idea of that. But then the rules can vary. So your plan document specifies how your plan handles it. So it's not enough to say, what are the rules? You've got to know what your plan document says. Then you've got to know, OK, if this is the method the document says, I'm supposed to, as an employer, verify the existence of the need and the amount of the need. Well, how do you do that? It's not written in the document. Nobody's going to explain it. So you not only have to read the document, you have to write a procedure. So you have, there's a procedural aspect. How do you handle a hardship distribution? And then, uh, then you actually have to do it. So you've got to collect the information. And the auditors are all over this. Has anybody been through an audit recently with the IRS or DOL? A couple hands. Yeah. They're, they're, did they talk about hardships? <laughs> I'm sorry to hear it. I, I, had, a, I had a client in Tennessee uh, who, who's heavy-handed auditor behavior caused him to um, want to take the matter up with all manner of Congress people and senators and other officials. And he was persuaded with help of counsel not to do that. But um, the auditors can be pretty heavy-handed. And they're, for whatever reason, they're just really going after hardships. Um, you've got to implement right. And then you've got to keep the documentation so you can prove you did it. And they can still bug the heck out of you like my, they did my client in Tennessee. So, so the knowledge burden of all of this can be substantial, and then you got to have procedures and all. This is fiduciary 101. A lot of rules, plan document, which you're supposed to read. Very few people do. You know, uh, the lawyers will always say, "What does the document say?" It turns out nobody read the document. Clients don't read plan documents for the most part. Um, and 
you get the idea with all this stuff. These are burdens, these are things you do, and we can probably boil it down to this. It is labor, cost, headaches, and risk. The labor is a couple different uh, pieces, but you're gonna spend time learning this stuff, spend time doing this stuff. There's cost associated with that, as well as direct cost. It creates headaches, like for the client who had to go back in and clean up uh, a couple of uh, uh, administrative failures, and there's legal risk associated with it. So what do you do with a legal risk? There's, uh, so one of, uh, one of the courses of study I took was the CFP, uh, Certified Financial Planner. So one of the things they teach certified financial planners is the four things that you can do with risk. You can reduce, retain, avoid, or transfer risk. So, you know, from an insur what is insurance? Insurance is a risk transfer. You're taking a risk, you're transferring it to somebody else. You could avoid a risk, all right? Be cool to avoid the risk of death, not an avoidable risk, all right? You can minimize the, the, uh, uh, the likelihood of death, though. So my wife showed me a video the other day of, it's a series of photos, then the caption is, why, why women live longer than men? And it's a picture of men, like, standing on ladders on the side of buildings and, you know, just doing incredibly stupid things. Uh, so you can, you can reduce your risk um, by doing certain things. Some risk you just retain. You just say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep some of my risk. The insurance deductible is the retention of risk. Um, and, of course, you can transfer. You can have somebody else do the work or take the responsibility for you. You can do the same thing with labor, with cost, and with headaches. You can lay off labor cost, headaches, and risks to a variety of, of extents when it comes to fiduciary responsibilities. So uh, <clears throat> some of you might remember Tom Peters. So Tom Peters was a, one of the management gurus back from the 80s, and he wrote a book called In Search of Excellence and a bunch of others and studied big companies and excellent companies. And, but one of, the, one of the stories that I always remembered was his story about um, bowling. So if you think about a professional bowler, I, I've bowled several times in my life, but you know, on my best day, maybe a 130 um, at a 300. 300 is the best thing. So to really bowl well, you got to roll the ball just right and lift weights and whatever you got to you know, line up on the little triangles. But most people are just going to throw the ball, do what they're going to do. So it raises the question, how do you set things up to where ordinary people can bowl, uh, if not a perfect game, pretty high? So I'm going I'm to shift gears here. And I'm going to show you how, as a leader, you do it. So I remember, if, if you remember taking your kids bowling when they were little, you know they got the little ramp. So take the bowling ball, you set it on the little ramp, and the kids get all excited um, because the ball just rolls down the middle of the alley. The way Tom Peters described it was uh, the way that you bowl a strike is you put the gutters right down the middle of the alley. So you, you put up little walls, like the kid, the kid walls that go over the gutters so it'll bounce off the gutters. You put those things right down the middle of the alley. You put the little ramp at the end. Anybody can bowl strike. So the job of leadership, his point was, is to create a situation where anybody could bowl a strike. I, that always stuck with me. So how do we make it simpler to get it right? So I think part of the problem with the message that you have to listen to about retirement plans is how do you bowl a strike? It's hardship distributions are complicated. Plan documents are complicated. How are you supposed to bowl a strike? Are you supposed to go practice bowling every day? Or how about if you just don't have to do it? And so <clears throat> the emphasis is on um, how not to do it or how to mitigate it, <clears throat> how to reduce your risk, what risks should you retain, um, how do you avoid risks, and what risks can you actually transfer? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw some pictures. So. This is how plans work. Plan sponsor, trustee, administrator. All right, so you've heard about fiduciaries. And by the way, in every presentation like this about fiduciaries, somebody always puts a slide up there saying, here's the ERISA definition of a fiduciary and walks you through it. That's not helpful, I don't think. You're the plan sponsor as an employer. You make a fiduciary decision to choose a trustee and an administrator. The trustee is responsible for everything having to do with the assets, and the administrator is responsible for everything having to do with the administration. Um, you hear, you'll probably hear this thing, 338 investment manager, what does that mean? Or a 321 investment advisor, you hear those terms, what does that mean? Well, those are people who either advise the plans, typically the plan sponsor, they could advise the trustee, it, it, 
if the trustee's an individual, it works, you know, like the company, it works that way. But somebody at the company's getting advised, or there's an investment manager, they're taking care of the investment side. Um, on the administrative side, it's typically the company who's named as the administrator. Why are these roles important? You've got a 140-page legal document. It's got your name on it. So a business owner or executive gets it. I've got a 100-page legal document. It has my name on it. That means something, all right? Well, what it means is that you're the trustee, and you have work to do, and you're the administrator, and you have work to do. Um, there is another variant of this where um, s some would impose another layer here. And my chicken scratch here is NF, or named fiduciary. So we have a trustee, we have an administrator, and now there's another layer called a named fiduciary. I'll come back to this in a little bit because I'm going to give an example of, all right, who are the types of people you could hire to transfer these responsibilities to, and what does it actually mean? Um, some would say there is a, another layer here, and you could hire somebody to be that layer, and that they choose the trustee and the administrator. I think as a practical matter, that business model doesn't work very well, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but this is the basic structure, and those are the responsibilities that you're looking to lay off. So, what does it mean to be a fiduciary? So, again, there's the ERISA definition. That doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, you're the employer, and I mentioned earlier, you got to know the rules. You've got to know things like um, how hardship distributions work, about eligibility and entry, and what the match formulas are. And if you go to a uh, per payroll match period that your HCEs might not get to max out their contributions. I just, a client yesterday had that problem. I was like, yeah, if you had to check that box instead of that one, you wouldn't have had that problem um, on the plan document. Um, so you have to know uh, a little bit about how retirement plans work. You don't have to read all the laws and regulations. You then have to read your plan document. You then have to come up with procedures and you have to implement those procedures and you got to document it. This is Fiduciary 101. Know, know some basics, read your plan document, establish some procedures, follow the procedures, prove that you can do it through documentation. You're supposed to communicate with your employees. There are terminated participants you gotta communicate with. The way that you communicate with them uh, is dictated by regulation. So you're allowed to send email addresses or use a corporate internet portal only if you meet certain criteria and only for certain documents. A lot of people kind of skip over that. And then you get these stragglers out there like um, beneficiaries and uh, alternate payees from domestic relations orders and so on. You've got to deal with the IRS, turn in the Form 5500, and, and of course you've got back and forth with your service provider. The point is you are in the middle. The reason you are in the middle is because of that governance diagram, plan sponsor, trustee, administrator, whose name is there as the trustee and the administrator. It's your name. The reason you're in the middle is because of that legal arrangement that makes you the trustee of this trust and the administrator of this plan. Um, so if you don't want to do that, if you want uh, a risk transfer, you got to get out of the middle. You got to move up here so the employer is out of the way and you need the service providers somehow to take care of this stuff. Let them worry about what the rules and the procedures are. Let them communicate with the employees and the former employees you get yourself out of the middle. How do you do that? Well, you've got to take your name off the legal document. All right, so um, now you might think, okay, well, how, how come I haven't heard of that? It's, it's evolved recently. So it's only in the last 10 years or so that this has really become a thing. When ERISA, the retirement plan law, first came out, um, it established all these rules, and the, the industry kind of went, no, I don't want to be a fiduciary. So we'll sell services to these folks. We'll sell investments but we're not going to be a fiduciary. They're going to be the fiduciary. So client, we need you to be the trustee. We need you to be the administrator, but we'll, we'll give you these support services. And the pitch is we're going to do everything for you, right? And that, that'll get you in trouble in more ways than one, like on payroll. Um, and I'll, I'll circle back to payroll in a minute too. But this is the basic um, meaning of being a fiduciary. You're in the middle of this stuff. You're in the middle of it by virtue of having agreed to do so on a legal document. The only way to get out of the middle is not to be on the legal document. Um, so how do you outsource? What are the different ways? And I don't want to overcomplicate it, but I want to I leave you with a sense of the methods that you could use to do this a little bit differently. So on the investment side, you hear the term 321. I prefer to say 321 advisor. ERISA section 321 is the definition of fiduciary. It's a broad term. It is not specific enough to say 321. 
Everybody does it anyway. But an investment advisor gives you advice about investments but does not choose them. You choose them with the help of that advice. An investment manager, as defined by ERISA Section 338, chooses the investments. You have appointed that person to choose the investments. Um, and there's something called a discretionary trustee. You can hire a trust company or a bank with trust powers to be the trustee of the plan. And instead of them being what's called a directed trustee, and either working with a, an outside investment manager or just leaving the investments to the client, instead of that type of trustee, you could get a discretionary trustee and they choose the investments. Um, so as a practical matter, when you choose a discretionary trustee, you're, you're choosing that bank or trust company's own product, if you will, their own record keeping system. So uh, the 338 manager is very similar. So these two things are very similar. They're both managing, they're both choosing, they're both transferring the liability. They're getting your name off the document. The 338 manager has more flexibility as to platform. Um, there are other differences, um, but the, that's kind of the practical difference as I see it. Um, you see the term 316. So a 316 administrator, that's ERISA section 316. It's just the person named in the document as the plan administrator. Who's the fiduciary responsible for administering the plan in accordance with its terms? That's the administrator. It says administrator in the plan document. There's a name there. It's usually the company. And that means some individual at the company. That's the way ERISA liability works. It's personal. Some individual at the company has the responsibility on behalf of the company for administering the plan in accordance with its terms and is supposed to read it and have procedures and know the rules and so on. <coughs> um, and then finally, sponsorship has its own burdens. So the need to have a plan document, to keep it up with IRS rules, um, to, have a, to appoint your own fiduciaries like the trustee and the administrator, to have a committee, to have meetings, to keep minutes, to approve documents, that stuff goes along with having your own plan. There's something called a multiple employer plan that if you join it, um, the burdens of sponsorship largely go away. None of these take away all responsibility can't be done, all right? There's always gonna be some responsibility left, but the fact that there's some left doesn't mean that you can't get rid of most of it, or you can choose the parts that you get rid of, what you retain versus what you get rid of. Now there's another way of dividing up um, the nature of folks who will take burdens from you, and that is by the legal extent of their responsibilities. So think of this as a spectrum from ministerial that's a non-fiduciary. So you're hiring a service provider, they're not gonna be a fiduciary. The investment business used to hang its hat on being non-fiduciaries. You had a, an investment broker who was a stock broker or um, investment salesperson. They would sell mutual funds or other products to you for a commission and their, their belief was, or their, their compliance department's belief, was that they were non-fiduciaries for that purpose. They were consultants, ministerial. Um, that has changed. Department of Labor changed that um, as of June 9th of this year, actually. So pretty much any investment person who is working with you on your plan is probably a fiduciary and is probably one, this type right here, or I'm sorry, here. So limited scope fiduciaries are limited by contract. So instead of having a broad responsibility, they have a responsibility that's defined by a document. So you want to know what they're responsible for? You look to that document they're pretty much only gonna be responsible for that stuff. That means you've got the rest. So the problem with that is, do you know what the rest is? Whereas the, the, the last category here, the full scope stuff, these are named fiduciaries. The folks named in the document, the trustee and the administrator, they have the broad responsibility for managing the plan and um, the, uh, it's up to them to kind of carve out and say what they're not responsible for. As a practical matter, most of these as well try to take an approach of we will only do these things. Some will accept a broad scope of authority, but most will limit what they do um, in some way. All right, so real quickly, what do these things mean? So the plan sponsor appoints a trustee. You've got directed. I can do this. And you've got discretionary. Um, a directed trustee accepts your direction on investments discretionary does not. All right, so a discretionary trustee puts its name on the document as the trustee and accepts responsibility for the investments. A directed trustee is the trustee responsible for safekeeping, um, not responsible for choosing investments. A, an investment advisor 
is if this is the advisor, there's a dotted line here advising the plan sponsor or the trustee. We give you advice. You then make the decisions. You're still responsible, plan sponsor, trustee for those decisions, but we're using, you're using our advice. That is a pretty strong level of insulation, actually, if you have a good process. But a step further would be an investment manager. Now you have the, I'll just call it IM, the investment manager is choosing the investments. They're typically appointed direct by the plan sponsor. That's a transfer of responsibility. You've taken it and you've transferred it. The advisory role, you haven't transferred it, you've mitigated it, you've reduced it. Um, an issue, if you hire a, an investment manager, um, what is their universe? So their universe of investments might be, the, this, let's say this is the whole universe of investments, or it might be a piece of it. So if you hire a record keeper who has 1,000 mutual funds on their platform, folks, that's plenty. You can find prudent investments among 1,000 investments, or 500, or probably 200. But at some level, the constraints may matter, and that's something to be aware of, that if you hire an investment manager and you say, I'm only working with company X, um, whatever company X makes available on its platform, that's the pond that the manager is fishing in. The smaller the pond, potentially the more risk that you're keeping on yourself. Um, but realistically, if there are enough funds on the platform, the manager's got plenty to fish from, and uh, it's fine. But it's something to be aware of. <clears throat> All right, those are the investment um, outsourcing uh, types that you can do. What about the administration? So I, I use this slide because nobody can read it, mainly, but um, this comes from a plan document. The word administrator appears in the plan document over 300 times. Uh, it's, it's a complicated role, and the detail, the technical knowledge needed to understand this is profound and, and difficult to master. So, you know, things like, what are our responsibilities with respect to the blackout? or if we do a fund change. When does a fund change become a blackout? You normally don't have to fool with that, and yet that legal burden is left on you. Your service providers are there to help you, and yet these are things you're responsible for if you're the administrator. In a lot of cases, you're called upon to intercede, to approve a document, to send a document to somebody, to sign a document, send it to the government. Um, there's stuff for you to do, and it's your stuff to do because you are the administrator. So. Uh, you can get rid of some of these chores, you can get help with these chores, or you can get rid of these chores. Um, there are different ways of doing that. So uh, the, the 316 administrator, again, that's just the ERISA definition of who's the plan administrator. You can hire someone to help. So one way to do that would be, let's call it uh, ministerial, I'll just put min, and then limited scope. So a ministerial service provider might, for example, help you with mailings. You're supposed to mail stuff to your employees and your terminated employees and you don't want to do them, you don't want to lick the stamps yourself. And so your record keeper will agree to do that for you for a fee. They're not offering to be a fiduciary responsible for delivery of documents to your employees, former employees, alternate payees. They're not taking that responsibility, they're just saying, if you tell us whom to send stuff to, we'll send it. That's a ministerial function. Or you could get somebody to accept fiduciary responsibility for it. Hey. I will approve the loans for you. I will make sure that those loans meet the requirements of the prohibited transaction exemptions. And if they don't, it's my problem because I'm approving the loans. So a limited scope fiduciary could take that one task, be a fiduciary for that task, and take it off of your plate. But the other tasks <coughs> would still be yours. Um, or you can do a full scope 316. So what does that mean? Very simply, it means they're named as the administrator in the plan document, and they don't carve out too much stuff. So if you, if you appoint some entity or person to be the administrator, you're not the administrator. You gotta make sure it's a prudent choice, all right, but now you've transferred either, not the full, realistically, there's always something that you can't get rid of, but you can transfer large portions of it. Um, One other type of outsourcing, a multiple employer plan. So uh, in, if you sponsor a plan, so let's say you have you know, five different employee, employers here. Every one of those employers is gonna have a plan document. They're gonna have an investment policy statement. They're gonna have a committee. They have to appoint their own uh, trustee administrator. They're gonna have to approve their own documents, mail their own stuff. Um, 
file their own 5500. So there's, there, those chores are duplicated five times. In a multiple employer plan, they're done once for the whole group. So you shed more stuff in that structure. This is not very common uh, yet. It's about 2% of the marketplace. It is growing. It's uh, limited right now to specialized groups like uh, you know, a particular industry in a particular region. Uh, uh, and it's coming to smaller market plans. So plans below, say, 20 million of assets. There are options emerging and have been for about 10, 15 years. So, uh, and there's lots of interest. Congress loves these things. So um, this is going to be a big deal going forward. Something to look for in contracts. I'm not going to dwell on this, but you'll get these slides after so you can see what I'm pointing to. These are just examples of language from contracts. Um, and it, it could apply to any fiduciary role of anybody that you're hiring. But what are they agreeing to do? This is language consistent with a limited scope fiduciary. They're being very clear. We will only accept this stuff. So what is that stuff? Is it the stuff you want and what are you left with would be your logical questions. Similarly, you have to look at limitations of liability. There's guidance from the Department of Labor on this. There was a, an old uh, uh, a letter, I forget, you know, information letter from the Department of Labor that had to do with um, a, an actuary who put a, a limit of liability in their contract saying, hey, we're not liable for more than $250,000 of losses. And the, the law doesn't permit that. So an exculpatory provision is a provision that exculpates or removes from liability the person who's you know, offering to provide the service. If you say, hey, my limit of liability is a million bucks, if that's with respect to a fiduciary function, that's, that's not valid under ERISA. But <clears throat> if you're offering a variety of services, some of which are fiduciary, some not, that provision would probably hold. Um, so it doesn't mean it's a terrible idea, but uh, it means that you've got to realistically assess what that means. There's one other thing that I'm going to, I'll leave you with a thought of. There is a flavor of outsourcing out there that we go back to the plan sponsor and this separate party, the named fiduciary, who is responsible for overseeing the trustee and the administrator. <clears throat> this model evolved to a large extent out of a guy who is now in prison, actually, um, who adopted this model and, and inserted himself here and said, I'm responsible for the entire plan in a lot of ways. So there, there were a group, there's a group of advisors out in the industry who sort of embrace this model. It's a valid model. The problem is how do you get clients? How do you get a client if you're this person? Well, you go to investment advisors, you go to record keepers, you go to third party administrators and say, bring me your clients. Well, that creates a conflict of interest. You're not supposed to oversee the person who brought you a client. There's guidance in the Department of Labor's regulations about that. So you can't have the conflict of interest. What would make you independent? <clears throat> the DOL says roughly 2%. If 2% of your revenues come from that one client, we'll consider you independent. Maybe 5% in some older guidance. Right. There's nobody out there that fits that definition. So as a practical matter, this isn't a horrible thing, but you're, you're usually talking about some individual or a, a firm of two or three individuals that have hung out a shingle um, if that business model has legs, it's, we're years away from it having legs. And I, I'm not knocking the folks who are doing it. I know some of them, they're great people, all right? It's just that I think it's difficult, um, especially for a larger employer to brace that right now. All right, let's shift back to risk. That was really about work and tasks. So when you shift responsibilities, you're shifting labor. You're shifting the knowledge burden. You don't have to know what you have to know. You're shifting headaches, all right? You're, instead of you having to deal with the self-correction because you did your payroll wrong, because a lot of times the reason things go wrong is because of the client. It's not the vendor. Sometimes it's the vendor. But you shift to the burden of dealing with that. Um, that's about work and headaches. This is about risk. Let's just talk about liability risk. So um, I was in, this is a little dated, but I still love it. This guy, uh, Mark Machis, is a former investigator for the Department of Labor and he was the head of the Philadelphia, he might still be the head of the Philadelphia office, but uh, talking about being a plaintiff's lawyer that he would wish every judge had the soul of an Old Testament prophet or at least the avuncular solicitude of an old time court of equity protecting the children of the wealthy from the venality of bank trust departments and wicked stepmothers. So, but uh, the courts are all over the map, partly because judges are not ERISA specialists, judges are generalists and they go all over the place with the judgments that they make and some of them are really bad. 
uh, just, I mean, bad law. And, and others are really strict, and you just, you can't really predict it. How does the DOL and the IRS look at it? And his comment is, as I used to say as an investigator for the DOL, resistance is futile. Um, so my experience working with uh, regulators, and I, I was founding chair of the Government Affairs Committee for our trade organization, NAPA, National Association of Plant Advisors, um, spent plenty of time in Washington, DOL, IRS, SEC. They, they, you know what, they are public servants, they care deeply, they view themselves as the champion of the people, and you are bad in their eyes. You have to understand that. You are the enemy. You are the evil overlord who is, you know, making all these employees work and taking away their overtime and things like that. That's just the way they view it. So if you give them a rule, they will seek minutia to find that you didn't implement that rule correctly. The more rules, the more minutia, and that is how the regulatory burden increases, is by giving them minutia to dig for. So if you think I'm, that sounds like I'm advocating for fewer, reg I am, I am, I've seen it. Um, and I view myself as a friend um, and an admirer of the Department of Labor and, and the things that they do. But this is just a reality. The, the regulatory burden is dramatic. So can you, in fact, offload liabilities? So this is a question I've had for years. It's clear cut in the law. So ERISA section 405, um, or, uh, the DOL regulations under you know, a, a 1975 interpretive bulletin, they're explicit. If you delegate a task to a fiduciary, um, as long as you've done so prudently, and as long as you're not aware of some skullduggery that they're engaging in and you're not doing anything about it, uh, you're not liable. You are not liable for the acts and omissions of somebody you delegate to. So that is a powerful tool that you can, in fact, delegate. But there are some things you, can't, <coughs> you cannot delegate. Um, you can't delegate the responsibility to choose fiduciary. So you're choosing service providers. You're choosing people like RJ Financial. Um, and uh, that is a fiduciary decision. You got to send money in. Nobody's going to write your checks for you. So when you have contributions due, you got to send them. And data. Data is huge. So let's talk about how to avoid risk um, and reduce risk via data and plan provisions a little bit. So uh, the data part is a, is a big deal, and it primarily happens through payroll, but it's more than that. So if you look at the data cycle in a retirement plan, this is where all the problems happen. So if you can get the data part right, you're going to eliminate half the problems that could happen. So um, how does it work? So payroll goes to the record keeper, and it goes back to the employer. So you send data to the record keeper. They send stuff back. An employee took, made a deferral change or had a hardship distribution or whatever, and now they send the stuff back. Uh, you've got to put that in your payroll system. That's where it goes bad a lot of the time. You got an email. It said you were supposed to make a change to the payroll system, but you didn't. Usually the employee will catch it. Maybe not. I just dealt with one where it went two and a half years, and the employee came up and said, hey, you know what, I, I, uh, I made this deferral change. Well, when did you make it? Uh, 2015, January. Um, had to go back and fix it for the whole time period. Employer wrote a $12,000 check. So you got to get that stuff in the system. Um, there are things to be aware of. So you can automate these processes to reduce your, your workload. I'm not sure it reduces your risk. So if you do it right, automating the payroll cycle will reduce your risk. You got to do it right. Um, so what I mean by that is when you send stuff in, alerts pop up, right? It says there's a problem with your payroll file. If you don't deal with that, you've just let bad data go into the system. It will never come out until you fix it, and sooner or later it'll cause a problem. On the back end, when it's going back, if you don't enter it correctly, that de bad data is now in the system. It's going to keep going. <clears throat> Automating payroll is a way to automate the perpetuation of bad data. You cannot take yourself out of the process. So if you've heard the sales pitch, we get you out of this. You don't have to do anything because the payroll is going to talk to the 401k. That's a cool concept. It's just not true. And it's not true because it's not good for you to be completely removed from the process. And I could give lots of examples of that. So you can reduce your risk by just being aware of that and <clears throat> resigning yourself to the fact that in the payroll cycle, you can't be removed that in fact you have to have, that's where you should devote your attention to ironclad procedures. 
that's where you should devote your energy to learning. Devote it to the payroll cycle, and when they send you that annual questionnaire asking for the millionth time, are you part of a controlled group? Pay attention to that questionnaire. All right, that, those are very important exchanges. All right, I, this is another one I'll leave you with, but I just want to give you a sample of stuff that we see. So clients will say, I want this, you know? I want uh, my, car, my, my uh, car dealership salespeople's bonuses to be excluded from the definition of compensation. By golly, that's the way I've always done it. That's the way I want to do it. Well, guess what? You've just made it much more likely that you're going to have a problem by having a non-safe harbor definition of compensation. Um, you can have <clears throat> non-safe harbor definitions of hardship distributions, of disability. Uh, you can have different benefit structures for different employees. Different benefit structures for different employees, like group A gets this, group B gets that, the, the match is different, whatever. Well, depending on how the payroll system is structured, you either have to use divisional accounting in the record keeping system, or you've got to set them up as separate plans, but you still have to test them together, and you have summary plan descriptions that need to be different. If you send the same one, that's not automated. Now you have a custom summary plan description. You either need a lawyer or somebody else. These are cost factors. They're also opportunities for your administration to go wrong. So you can design your plan to be administration friendly. You can avoid the risk of something going wrong by simply not engaging in that behavior. And you do that through plan design. Another point that I see, so uh, the little history, my firm, Pentegra Retirement Services, we're a record keeper, we're a third party administrator, we're a 316 administrator, we're a discretionary trustee, we do all this stuff. Uh, we do multiple employer plans. We've had our hands in all this stuff, but let's just say that the number one thing we're known for is administration, um, the 316 part of that. And we work with a lot, with, with different record keepers in doing that. Some play nicely. Others don't play nicely, all right? And what ends up happening is if we need to ask a question like, what is the trigger for a deemed distribution on a loan? Not what does it mean to have a deemed distribution on a loan, we know that, what is the actual trigger in your system that will cause that to occur? Because we need to know whether it's actually going to work right or not so that we know when to intervene. And it's very difficult to even get that question answered. And some record keepers won't give you the time of day unless you're the client. And if you're the client, you don't know how to tell whether the answer is right. So you really need a collaborative environment among your service providers. You need a team effort. It works much better that way um, or your outsourcing efforts probably won't work as well. So let me wrap this up. Um, what can you do with risk? You can reduce, retain, avoid, or transfer risk. You can do the same with labor and headaches and some costs. How do you reduce um, your risk? Well, you do it by studying the rules, having knowledge about what you're supposed to be doing, by <coughs> creating processes for implementing your plan. Uh, you've read your plan document, you now have processes for implementation. You do in fact implement, you execute reliably, you document it well so that you can prove that you did so. You do so with the help of professional advice. Um, and if you're an individual working for a company, you want to reduce your personal risk, there ought to be an indemnification somewhere in your employment agreement. If you're acting as, in, and, and a lot of people in this room are 316 administrators, all right? There ought to be a piece of paper somewhere that says, hey, if in the course of my duties, um, I screw something up and I'm liable as a fiduciary, you company, you're going to make me whole, right? I've found that uh, at the board and executive level, everybody's protected, but you're probably not. So that's a reasonable thing to ask for is an indemnification of some sort. Those things reduce your risk. Um, they also reduce, um, to a degree, they can reduce labor through rework, but that's, that's an addition of labor usually. Um, <clears throat> and you can avoid headaches by reducing those things. You can avoid problems by some of these costly plan provisions that I went over. You can avoid uh, bad idea service arrangements. So doc, I love to pick on doctors. Anybody work for a, a, doc, a medical firm in here? So we'll pick on doctors. They want to do all kinds of crazy stuff with their investments. They want to go buy condos at Myrtle Beach and put it in the retirement plan and go have a vacation there during the summer, which is a prohibited transaction. And I could give you all kinds of stuff. Those are bad ideas. Stick to the kind of safe, uh, version. So avoiding service arrangements that, that give you trouble um, and stuff that make you uh, get it right. Uh, I was talking to an employer the other day. In order to keep a certain plan provision, um, they couldn't automate their payroll process and so they were forced to manually enter certain codes in their payroll system in order to get it right. 
and, it kept, and they kept getting it wrong. But it was because of this one plan provision. They could have avoided that by changing the plan design and just sort of given up on the idea that that was better than customizing it the way that they wanted. You can transfer responsibility through a 338, a 316, a discretionary trustee, um, and, uh, or a multiple employer plan. And then what should you retain? You only retain what you want. <clears throat> you can uh, outsource some. You can not outsource others. So last couple points here. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact, you know, my, uh, as I've looked at my career and, and what I like to do with retirement plans, it makes me happy when uh, the employer wins and the employees win and everybody's happy. But I want you to just think about this fact that if you're the administrator, you're the one overseeing this, or if you're the investment fiduciary, but whatever your fiduciary role is as an employer, it is thankless, literally thankless. The only recognition you will get is bad recognition, for the most part, if you think about that, especially with administration. Something goes wrong, you will be recognized for your efforts, all right? If everything goes perfectly, silence. You don't win um, if everything goes perfectly, you lose if it goes wrong. That's not a great situation. So I have, uh, at, at the risk of being self-serving, I've, I've said for years, knowing what I know about retirement plans, if I'm the CFO or CEO or HR manager of a decent sized company and looking at the retirement plan, I'd be crazy not to outsource this stuff. I get nothing for it but headaches and extra work um, and nobody thanks me for it but they, they sure notice if something goes wrong. So again, what do you do? Um, those are the things you can do. And the idea is to build the gutter ball. You're, you're trying to make it so you can roll strikes. And the best way to do it is not to have to practice it. Put the gutters down the middle, put the little ramp at the end, and here's, here's at least a picture of, my, of the little girl. Put the little ball on the ramp, ball goes down, rolls a strike. That's the way to do it. All right, any questions? So the question is, is if you left a position where you were a fiduciary, how long does your liability extend? Kind of what's the statute of limitations? Um, it depends. So first of all, statute of limitations for ERISA is six years. Um, but if, if you, and it, it, there are certain types of problems that could go longer than that, but it's basically fraud, um, which happens, by the way, lot, happens a lot. But um, six year tail of liability. And there are cases where you know, individuals um, have been held responsible for really big claims, even at big companies where you would think that, that they'd be off. Like there's one case, a guy named Ayers, A-Y-R-E-S, got nailed for a failure of a prior fiduciary because he knew about it and didn't do anything about it. So um, the prior fiduciary, I think, was passed away or something. Um, Is there a similar tale for the So the question is, is there a similar tale for the insurance? You know, I don't know. That'd be a question for your insurance agent. I think there is a limit, and you're covered by insurance that the company has. I would think that you're covered with respect to acts while you work for that company, but I do not know. Other questions? Yes. So the question is uh, asking to comment on the trend toward low cost, low fee versus hiring an advisor to help with investment decisions. I, the, first of all, those things are not mutually exclusive. I would throw in the category of you got to be crazy. You got to be crazy not to have an investment advisor or investment manager in today's world. Those big claims that we're talking about, you insulate yourself. You need to schlichter proof yourself. As a friend of mine says, Jerome Schlichter is the lawyer in St. Louis who's suing everybody and making millions and millions of dollars. So you gotta schlichter-proof yourself, and the odds you're gonna do that without a professional advisor are so close to zero, I wouldn't contemplate it. Now, do you tell your advisor, I want index funds, because that's safer? Sure. It's annoying to me, really annoying to me, that we're being forced to do that. It really is, you know? The way that this industry has evolved, it squashes innovation. 
irritates the heck out of me. So where's the investment innovation? Where's the cool stuff people could try? But they can't do it because if they don't hire, if they don't use an index fund, somebody's going to sue them. Annoying. But safer, probably. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Pete.